I think it's worked well. It's not it's not a perfect answer, but it's an attempt to get past the fiction. And the fiction is killing us in this country, as it is in Europe. Yeah, I thought it's interesting what you said about being uh, taken hostage, if you will, by the alliance commitments, uh, because uh, these days it seems like the key, uh, a lot of the America's identity, well, self-identity at least, uh, in terms of its role in the world, is to lead the world, and uh, this is, you know, based on this uh, on the idea uh, of uh, ad helping other countries advance freedom, democracy. Of course, these are good ideals, one could argue, but they're also tied a bit to the Wilsonian argument that uh, the U.S. should make the world safe for democracies. But uh, it, it wouldn't have to be built that strongly into the U.S. psyche, I guess, because America was founded on other traditions as well. Um, in terms of uh, yeah, the farewell speech by George Washington, he he made this point that it's our true policy to steer away from permanent alliances uh, with uh, the yeah, with the foreign world, and you know have people like John Quincy Adams uh, arguing not to go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. So there there seems to have been uh, also some uh, which are advocating for not ruling the world or not leading the world necessarily to the same extent. And the war well, in this foreign Well, Americans are increasingly questioning this uh, thing called democracy. I mean, what we call a republic, which we are a republic, not a democracy. We have representative government, but we have democratic processes here in the United States. And Americans are looking at these democratic processes and they recognize that they're corrupted, that they've been perverted and subverted. So we regard this word democracy as something that is divorced from reality here in our own country. In other words, we're worried about electoral integrity. We're worried about free and fair elections. We want officials who are not corrupt. We want a bureaucracy that is not corrupt. Why are we overseas preaching when we here at home have serious problems with our own quote-unquote democracy? So that's the first problem. The second thing is how does it uh, help promote the notion of democracy by bombing the living daylights out of people that don't agree with you? Now, the things that we have historically done is when someone doesn't agree with us or, or questions our policy is we, we try to bully them. When we can't bully them, then we turn to sanctions. If the sanctions fail, as, as they have demonstrably against Russia and China and other countries, well, then we bomb them. You know, th this is... This is all in the name of democracy. It doesn't make any sense at all. And the notion that there is some liberal order that has to be defended, if it has to be defended, then why are we the ones initiating all the offensive military action to bomb and, and harm people? In other words, where, where's the evidence for defending anything? In other words, our armed forces are not being used to defend us. The United States and the West are being used to attack others, especially since those others have not attacked us. And, and presenting people with fiction, suggesting that if we do not preemptively attack someone, that they will attack us is nonsense. You know, Bismarck was right. Uh, preemptive war is uh, tantamount to committing suicide out of fear of death. It needs to stop. We need to get out of this business. But we've been doing it now for decades. I would argue we've been doing it since 1965, since we went into Vietnam. How well has it worked? Take a look at the world. It hasn't worked very well. Yeah, because it seems often the political uh, differences appear in uh, what, which war should be prioritized. So in past, was it, should we go after the folks in Afghanistan or Iraq? In these days, it seems to be a split between focusing on Russia or China. Uh, it, did, it would be interesting with a deeper uh, discussion, I guess, into what, what should be the role. And uh, I know they probably not an appetite in the U.S. for taking... Uh, advice from Putin, but I remember in his uh, 2007 Munich speech, he made this argument that uh, uh, this world, uh, the unipolar world, he said it was not just uh, damaging for all the countries in the international system, but also for uh, the United States itself, because he argued it would, uh, in this quote, destroy itself from within. And uh, this is, uh, again, another new idea that one would exhaust its resources and uh, yeah, cause all these internal uh, differences uh, and, and problems. Uh, but uh, uh, but I wanted to ask you about uh, what do you think the priorities of the U.S. should do? Because, well, the way I see it, often success can be a curse because 
the US has been extremely successful in terms of will, will, which is why it's so powerful. Or, but foreign policy is often about foreign priorities. So under hegemon, one can do many mistakes and absorb uh, a lot of the costs uh, over time, of course. But uh, well, over time, uh, this ability diminishes. I was just with with all of these wars, uh, m- many of them have exhausted US energy and resources, uh, and not also, also not producing the desired outcome. Uh, how 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 should the United States reorganize its priorities? Uh, what 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 should it focus on uh, going forward? Well, Glenn, you've uh, raised the most important question: What is the source of American national power and influence? And I would argue that it has very little to do with military power, contrary to popular belief. First and foremost, it's our economic strength, the prosperity we have built at home. Prosperity enables you to do many things, not only raise the standard of living for your population and make life better for Americans, which is what we historically tended to focus on before 1965, but it also enables you to build up friendships and alliances with others who want to benefit from your largesse. Remember, when Washington was president, he and Hamilton used to talk about America's mission in the world. Jefferson thought our mission in the world was, surprise, surprise, spread democratic ideals. Washington and Hamilton disagreed completely. They said our mission in the world is to become the engine of prosperity for the world. Because they argued, if we are prosperous and successful with our form of government and our economic development, then others in the world will want to emulate us. And they, too, will adopt similar approaches on the basis of the success that we demonstrate. Washington and Hamilton won that argument. What a lot of people don't understand is that Jefferson at the time wanted us to cast our lot with the French Revolution. Uh, And, you know, Washington thought that was sheer lunacy. First of all, he pointed out we have nothing in common with the French Revolution. These people are, are murderous maniacs who are destroying their own country ruining their institutions and killing their elites. We didn't do any of that during the American Revolution, quite the contrary. If anything, the American Revolution was a very conservative one, far closer to Cromwell and the Puritan Revolution than to anything that happened in France. We wanted nothing to do with that. So Jefferson was viewed as a a nice person who was intelligent and certainly capable, but had temporarily lost his mind. The interesting part is that when Jefferson becomes president, he does not govern at all in the way that he had previously advocated. And he is very conservative in the way he approaches the world. Our strength lies in our prosperity and our economic foundations. It lies, or it used to lie, with the strength of our government. We we had a government that was very honest. By There's always a certain amount of corruption in every large bureaucratic structure. Our bureaucracy was relatively small. We did not have oversee holdings. We we regarded the country that we had from the Atlantic to the Pacific as a de facto empire. We didn't need to go in search of a, a wider imperial sphere of influence or power. Uh, that changes briefly with Teddy Roosevelt, uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, who comes out of the Spanish-American War and wants us to join with the British Empire and spreading our influence. But by 1910, nine years after we occupied the Philippines, he recognizes that staying in the Philippines was a terrible mistake. And we subsequently spent the next 35, 40 years trying to get out of the Philippines because we had no business being a colonial power, didn't want to be a colonial power. Uh, We flirted with this repeatedly over time because we were taken over by people on the left, principally uh, Wilson was the first, FDR was the second, then We have a breathing space until we really reach Lyndon Johnson in 1965. And he tries to take advantage of the same opportunity, committing us all over the world, particularly in Southeast Asia. Remember that Eisenhower, who was certainly more comfortable, excuse me, more, excuse me, more comfortable uh, with Washington's viewpoint Eisenhower looked at NATO and said when he when he agreed to join NATO, and effectively that meant to lead it, he said if it still exists in 10 years, we failed. In other words, NATO was not an end in itself. 
In other words, maintaining the wartime alliance and freezing the status quo around the world in ways that we thought were advantageous to us was not the goal. In other words, his goal and the goal of anybody that with any common sense on the right was to reinvigorate the, con the, the countries that had fought in the war so that they could return to normalcy, return to building prosperity in their own countries and do so in a fairly secure setting. Again, uh, this is why Eisenhower wanted to offer neutrality to the states of the Warsaw Pact in order to get out of this uh, unhealthy and destructive confrontation with the Soviet Union. Well, that's all history. We know what happened. Eventually, the Soviets do collapse. And one would have thought at that point, this is another opportunity to build prosperity beyond America's borders. What could we do to help Russia be prosperous and successful? or Ukraine, or any of the nations of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. I think there was some of that, but I think, on, unfortunately, it was perverted into, a, into the notion that whatever happens has to happen in a way that serves our interests. Okay, what are our interests? And you hit the nail on the head. Instead of looking at the prosperity we need to build at home and the good relations we would like to have with everyone, the absence of conflict rather than the promotion of it, we decided to pursue global, military, political, and most important, financial hegemony. And it's really the financial hegemony, more than anything else, that Russia and China and India, and now all the countries you see in the BRICS, want to get away from. They want to get out from under us and SWIFT and all of the other institutions that we control and manipulate to our advantage. And the military confrontation is really a manifestation of that conflict with the financial hegemony that we enjoy. And it's coming apart. It's very clear. When you have a 34, rapidly becoming a $35 trillion national sovereign debt, how much hegemony can you reasonably expect to exert over time? Not very much. And I think that's what uh, Putin and others have said to us privately and in the certainly in the discussion with uh, with uh, Tucker, he made it very clear, <clears throat> you have an enormous problem with debt. You have problems of your own at home. What are you doing in Eastern Ukraine? Five, 6,000 miles from your shores. And that's a very legitimate question. What are we doing there? All we're doing is promoting conflict, confrontation, and destruction. And no one is willing to make peace because we view this conflict, confrontation, and destruction as working to our advantage. I don't think it does. But I think that's the view in Washington, certainly is in London, and I suspect in many Western countries. How they think they're benefiting from this is beyond me, because at the same time, we have enormous problems with the invasions of our country by people who are not us in vast numbers that we cannot assimilate, we cannot afford, we cannot maintain. So we have our own problems, and that's essentially the message of the State of the Union response. Let's get back to business at home. Let's make things right here. Let's regain our fiscal health, our national health. Let's reinvigorate the energy sector instead of running away from uh, oil, gas, and coal, which we can utilize very effectively and competently in favor of uh, pie-in-the-sky schemes to make the world dependent upon solar power and things like this. We need, we need to do what's in the interest of our country. We need to do it intelligently. And that's not the only area. We, we need to get back into the business of high-end manufacturing. Just 30 years ago, 20 years ago even, we were at the top of our game in terms of uh, high-tech manufacturing. We aren't anymore. It's all migrated elsewhere. And we facilitated that. That is, our elites have facilitated it. So we, we have serious, serious problems here. And that's where we ought to focus. And I, I think most Americans agree with that, but the people in power do not. The ruling elite is very divorced in its thinking and mentality from the rest of the population. I remember being somewhat uh, optimistic in 2016 uh, on some of Trump's economic ideas, because for me, a lot of it uh, reminded me a bit about uh, the American system, uh, some vigorous um, industrial policies, but it uh, it seemed to have gone maybe a bit too far, not maybe, a bit too far in terms of uh, seeking to cripple uh, the development of China. That, that would maybe go too far. Uh, but the idea of an uh, industrial policy to strengthen the industrial base, it seems uh, a necessary part of the way of 
restoring former strength. But I was just curious, how how do you see the U.S. Uh, possibly resolving some of its economic ties, not just with China but the Russians? Because this is for me this besides the disaster on the on the battlefield, uh, one of the key catastrophes over the past ten years was. Uh, Russia, with its huge amount of resources, the largest economy in Europe now, they effectively have begun to decouple completely from uh, the West and they reorient their entire economy to the East, which is uh, giving the East, uh, you know, cheap resources. This huge Russian market, uh, it's um, it seems like an expression of self harm. It's very difficult to have discussions about this in at least in Europe because either you support sanctions or you're Putin is, but uh, we never discuss whether or not this actually is in our interest. So I'm just Curious, uh, given that they they couple themselves to a large extent now from the industries, uh, um, technology, swift payment systems, and also increasingly the dollar and the euro. How how would you aim to address this issue? And uh, I guess it would be in their interest to reconnect. Well, the first point that needs to be made is this notion that someone else's success in some area, whether it's Russia or Norway or any country in the world is somehow or another dis disadvantageous to us. In other words, someone else's success translates into our failure. This is a mentality that took root in the 1960s during the Cold War. It should have gone away in 1992, but it lingers. In other words, if the Chinese are growing and the Chinese are successful, they're feeding their population and there is peace in China, that's bad. It's bad because we don't enjoy the fruits of our own prosperity nearly as much as we should. Therefore, it must be someone else's fault. In other words, the joke in the United States, well, it's not really a joke. It's a, it's a it's an ugly feature of our culture, is that if something good happens somewhere else, it must be bad for us. If we have a problem with drugs, well, that's China's fault. If we have a problem with uh, uh, illegal immigration, well, that's China's fault. In other words, whatever is wrong, is someone else's fault rather than our own problem. Unfortunately, that goes down well with too many Americans who want to see ourselves as a sort of gleaming perfect society when in fact we know it's not. No society is perfect. Every, every society has flaws. But there's an unwillingness to see it in those terms. I think that's going to change because it's pretty hard to disguise the reality from Americans today the way it was 10 or 20 years ago. Now, when you, when you talk about Russia and BRICS in general, I think we have to understand that this is a natural reaction to us, our policies and behavior. If you want to change that reaction or alter it, we have to change our behavior. That's become very, very difficult because every everyone in Washington wants to continue confrontation, not cooperation. It wants to dominate, not cooperate. This is the problem in Washington, D.C. If we can't lead it, we don't want it. Do, do you understand? That is the mentality. And if you suggest, well, it may be better for us not to lead everything all the time, they say, oh, so you you must be one of these American last types. In other words, you want to lead from behind. Yeah, I, I may not want to lead at all. Remember this uh, stupid comment by uh, Madeleine Albright. We are the indispensable uh, superpower. Nothing, nothing can happen without us. Well, that was utter nonsense. Most of what happens on any given day in the world doesn't need to involve us. We used to take that position because we said, first and foremost, we need to focus on ourselves, on what's wrong at home and fixing it, improving ourselves before we go anywhere else. We threw that you know, off, off the bus a long time ago, and we've been riding this bus to disaster a destination with no future for us at all by saying that we have to be involved with everything. We don't. But this, we have to lead from the front and lead all the time, has actually been reinforced by our European allies, because our European allies have only too readily abdicated responsibility for themselves, for their countries, for their defense, in favor of what? Dependence upon us. I would, I would argue that today's European states are very similar to the Greek city-states at the time of the Roman Empire. And eventually, the Greek city-states, in order to maintain their independence from the king of Macedonia, another Philip who was constantly involving himself in, in Greek city-states internal matters, they called in the Roman legions. 
Well, the Roman legions came in, promptly defeated the Macedonians, but then they turned to the Greeks and said, look, we're not going to tolerate any more nonsense from you. So you've got to behave yourselves. You've got to govern yourselves effectively. Well, it was pretty clear that wasn't going to happen. So what happened? Greece became part of the Roman Empire. Well, we made you effectively the part of this illicit overseas empire that we created in the aftermath of World War II. It's over. We can't afford it. We, we don't need it. We don't want it. But you've got a problem. You've got to convince yourselves that you don't need us and that you can govern yourselves, that you can sort yourselves out. And there are an awful lot of elites right now, I call them the globalist elites, who are downplaying independence for European states. They, they see this as something bad. I think Europeans need to rediscover that they are in, them, in their own right nation states. They represent a different set of interests, different cultures, different peoples. You've got to find your own way forward. Now, this was something that Donald Trump said at the beginning of his previous administration. You know, he said Europeans need to be their own first responders. That was his way of saying you've got to wean yourselves off of dependence on us for military power and strength and, and support. In other words, you've got to build your own capabilities. That was his argument about spending on defense. That all seems to have failed miserably. All you have to do is take a look at the European states and NATO and look what's happened in Ukraine. Show me a state in Europe today that is remotely prepared to take on anybody militarily. As a friend of mine in the French army likes to say, Douglas, the only thing the French army is prepared to do is go on safari in North Africa. He's right. So what about the rest of you? Where do you fit in? Well, you don't. And you're expecting us to fill the vacuum. It should be pretty obvious at this stage, given our indebtedness, the weakness of our financial condition, the deteriorating condition of our armed forces, that that's an unrealistic expectation. Europeans are going to have to find their own way. Charles de Gaulle was right. He argued that in the 1960s, and he was summarily rejected. But he was essentially correct. It's time for Europeans to do that. I don't know how that's going to play out. But I think in answer to your larger question, when can Europeans get back to business with Russia, depends very heavily on the Europeans divorcing themselves from dependence on us. If you cannot end your dependence upon us, it's going to be very hard for you to find your own way with Russia, or for that matter, even with China. Yeah, that was actually another, besides the industrial policies, I think I think I liked with Trump, the, the fact when we say, oh, maybe we can't rely 100% on Washington, then, yeah, that, that well, that's a good thing. Yeah, we have to learn to stand on our own legs. I thought this was a, a, a positive aspect, but uh, it, it, it one, does... One last thing, Glenn, if I may yeah. say, it also requires people to look at the world differently through a different lens. The Europeans have uh, adopted this position of uh, self uh, self-identified moral supremacy. Therefore, Mr. Putin and the Russians are not on an equal footing with us. We are morally superior. We are morally superior because we think we, we respect human rights. We think we are democratically elected. Well, when I look at European states today, particularly places like Germany, uh, France, Great Britain, and I, I don't know about Norway, I see an awful lot of censorship that smacks of oppression, tyranny. If you cannot express your views because they run counter to the majority that seems to be in power, and I'm not even sure it's a majority, then, then you are oppressed. That's not respect for human rights. I don't see any evidence for that at all. I think if you're really worried about human rights, you would want a free and open society where everyone can express their views. This notion that some views are more morally justified than others has got to go away because who makes that decision? Well, that inevitably inevitably is being made by a government which is then tyrannical in nature. So I, I, I think that needs to stop this moral supremacy nonsense and stop uh, taking the position that unless Russia or China or India or Iran or anyone in the world reflects you, in other words, mirror images, whatever you think is appropriate, uh, it, it, unless you dump that, get rid of that viewpoint, you're going to have problems all over the world, which is what we've got. 
You know, people people complain all the time. You know, the Chinese are making inroads everywhere. Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, South Asia. They're doing business and we can't get into the door. Well, there's a damn good reason for that. The Chinese show up and they say, we're here to do business. How you govern yourselves is your business. How your society runs is your business. We're not here to tell you how to live. We didn't come here to tell you how to govern yourselves. We show up with a page of preconditions. Unless you meet all of these preconditions and look the way we think you should look, govern the way we think you should govern, then we can't do business with you. Well, surprise, surprise. Everybody says, well, the hell with the Americans. Let's uh, let's bring in somebody else because we're not prepared to change who and what we are to suit Americans. I see this thing right now with LGBTQRS or whatever it is at this point that we want to shove this down the throats of everyone in the world. Well, good luck with that approach because most of the world wants nothing to do with it. Most of the world is offended by it. Well, that's their privilege. We They do not have to adopt our position, especially since we're not even sure about our own positions on most of these issues. It's a, it's a minority government, a minority of people in power that tend to impose these things on us. That's why Americans listen to these words about democracy and they say, it doesn't matter for whom we vote. We get the same outcome. The two-party system is a sham. Who's really in charge? And increasingly, people look at the so-called oligarchs, the billionaires, who put their money behind the policies that they want, and the politicians dutifully carry out those orders from the oligarchs. Is that democracy? Of course not. It's nonsense. So, you know, the, uh, Europeans have to, have to take a long, good look at themselves. So do we. But they've got to get out of this business of imposing on others what we think is appropriate for them. And that begins, I would argue, immediately with Russia. And when people talk about Putin, I can find people that you can accuse of all sorts of terrible things who are sitting right now in the Senate of the United States in the White House. So the notion that somehow or another we are squeaky clean and governed by men who wear white hats and uh, sing in the choir every Sunday is a lot of nonsense. Yeah, it's true. You know, the, the judicial system in the United States consists or is composed of people who were appointed to their jobs under several different administrations. And frankly, from 1992 onwards, most of those judges uh, who were appointed stood to the left of center. Uh, there was some modest increment of uh, more middle, middle of the road, uh, politically centrist judges under Trump, but frankly, the majority fall into the leftist camp. Mm -hmm. Now, some of that varies with geography. You know, I wouldn't want to be tried for anything in New York City or Washington, D.C., or I would fully expect whatever they accuse me of, whether I was guilty or not, I'd be found guilty and end up in jail. Mm -hmm. That's how serious the problem is. So, yes, uh, again, everything that we Americans have taken for granted for 200 years has fallen apart. The institutions are facades. Behind them stand almost nothing. And public trust and confidence in these institutions is at an all-time low. What was your impression as a military man, as a high officer of the armed forces of the United States, what was your impression of the interview, Tucker Carlson, with President Putin? What's the essence? Uh, I think most of us view Tucker Carlson, when I say most of us, I'm talking about Americans in general, not just people in uniform. And when you talk about people in uniform, you always have to distinguish those at lower levels from the people at the top. And the senior ranks of the armed forces have been politicized for years. We can go all the way back to the Vietnam War. And until Kennedy was president, uh, Eisenhower and his predecessor seldom have ever appeared in public with anyone in uniform. And when the various chiefs of staff of the Army or the Navy came over to testify in front of the, the Hill, either the Senate or the House, they wore civilian clothes because it was, it was made very clear, don't wear your uniform and try to intimidate members. Wear civilian clothes and speak to them as American citizens. All of that went away in the 1960s. 
Mm-hmm. And since the 1960s, officers have been appointed to very high levels for the purpose of strengthening the political hands of the various administrations that have held power in the White House. In other words, if you stand next to a four-star and say, well, I'm here with General so-and-so, and you see all of these decorations, even though 90% of them are meaningless, uh, the assumption is, oh, yeah, he must be right, or he wouldn't have this general with him. The general is backing him up. Uh, and, of course, people were eager to be used as props for politicians that helped their careers, that that got them appointed. You know, Millie was a wonderful example of that. Mm-hmm. And so is his successor. So were most of his predecessors. They they were people that were user-friendly to whomever was in political power. Mm-hmm. So that's an enormous problem. So when you say, as a former professional soldier, how do I feel? Well, I see Tucker as a voice for freedom of speech, as someone who is a voice in the wilderness right now in the media in the United States, and for that matter, in the West. Mm-hmm. I've read a number of German reports that are just over the top. They make no sense at all describing Tucker Carlson as some sort of Putin agent. They don't realize the numbers of people in their governments that are bought and paid for by people like Soros and others. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tucker isn't bought and paid for by anybody, and neither am I. And I'm happy to list my sources of income and compare those with the retired generals that they bring onto the mainstream media, and gosh, you're going to be surprised where their money comes from. So suddenly their message is very predictable. So, no, I think it was a wonderful exercise in freedom of speech, and I would say that 90% of what President Putin said I agreed with completely. It was accurate. It was not an attempt to fabricate anything. Where he fell apart, in my judgment, was his discussion of the outbreak of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. That was unfortunate. I wish he'd have left that out completely because that was a blemish on an otherwise excellent discussion. Interesting was that um, President Putin was somehow... That was my impression, trying to convince the West that first, um, he's not this crazy invader who wants to conquer the world, but that this is a conflict with uh, the Ukraine, uh, which has very old roots, ancient roots almost, and that he's still focused on negotiating. That was, for me, um, the essence of this interview. Um, what is it for you? What was the most interesting thing you took out from that uh, conversation? No, I think you're right. Uh, as I said, what he said was truthful. The amazing part to me is that he continues to hold out hope that there will be a negotiating partner. And I would have thought that after his experience in 2022, when Boris Johnson showed up and destroyed the agreement that both sides had reached, it would have been clear to him that he, he wasn't going to have a negotiating partner. Mm-hmm. The second part is, I'm su- I'm surprised that he is still open to doing business with us in any form, because we have lied to him repeatedly for years and his predecessors. Now, here's something your viewers need to understand. Mr. Putin has always been known as friendly to the West, and he's probably, as a Russian senior leader, an individual who understands more about the West and appreciates it, particularly because of his years in Germany, than almost anyone else in the, in the Russian political elite. And I would be very concerned about what happens at some point when President Putin is no longer in charge, because others around him and many, many others who aspire to be in his place are very hostile to the West in ways that should frighten everyone. So, no, I agree with you. I think he did a wonderful job on that score. But, of course, it doesn't make any difference what he says because the media is in the hands of his opponents, and and frankly, our opponents, the people that are oppressing us, who are keeping the borders open, who are rewarding millions of people for coming to the country, passing out cash, uh, phones, ta- plane tickets, bus tickets, whatever they can get, and dumping them inside our country, much as you experienced after 2015, thanks to uh, uh, Mrs. Merkel and others. This is what faces us. And it's gonna. I, I think it's going to blow up in everyone's face but it probably won't blow up dramatically until the downturn in the economy really, really hits home. I mean, Because we can't afford them. Yeah. What is interesting in the reactions we had in Germany and in Switzerland, um, a lot of people pushed this interview aside saying, well, you know, Putin, he can say what he wants. He's this crazy dictator, he's this aggressor, he's this ruthless uh, autocrat. And just one week after this interview, we have the incident in this Siberian camp where 
Alexei Navalny died. I mean, it's very hard to say what the the reasons, what the, uh, uh, the 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 circumstances are. We have heard voices now from the Ukraine. The the the, the spy chief Budanov said, "Well, I have to disappoint you. Um, Navalny died of natural circumstances." It's very hard to say, but um, here in the West. In Europe, in Switzerland, people say, why do you listen to Putin? He's a killer. Look at Navalny. Look look what he does to the opposition. What would you counter um, to these concerned voices uh, who think Putin is this um, maniac, this killer on the throne in the Kremlin? Well, even a broken clock is right twice a day. And Budanov, too, can occasionally tell the truth. I think he's telling the truth. We shouldn't be surprised by that. He's been through some very tough times. He's been through extensive surgeries. His health hasn't been good. So that's not impossible. I know that he was under consideration for some sort of trade with the West and the United States of Navalny. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it appears, uh, and this is certainly substantiated by, I think, his wife's presence at the Munich Security Conference, he, he was always seen as the future Zelensky of Russia as the man who would take over and sell his country out to the West. Uh, and I think MI6 and CIA both viewed him in those terms. I can't prove that because I'm not on the inside, but that's what reliable sources tell me. Mm -hmm. But again, it doesn't make any difference because the, the media in the West is going to say what it says. The difference between, incidentally, you and us is that we have alternative media. I don't know how much alternative media you've actually got anymore. I mean, the stuff coming to me from Germany is absurd. I mean, the, the descriptions, uh, completely, fa uh, you know, fatuous nonsense. I don't know what to say. But we do have alternative sources of media, although there's a, an un ongoing effort, obviously, to suppress it. And uh, this is a sort of uh, idea of theory of complicity, that uh, anyone who doesn't uh, conform automatically to the mainstream narrative is dangerous and disruptive. Uh, which means he's telling the truth. So I think Tucker told the truth to the extent that he could. I think the interview is a success. It had a big impact here, more so probably here than in Europe. One has to stress the point that um, I haven't followed all your statements during this war, but when I heard you for the first time, I was always struck by your views and your um, predictions, which in my eyes seemed true it came out as you predicted and we, you were one of the very few voices prominent voices who said from the beginning that the ukraine is fighting an unwinnable war and then this fog of propaganda which is foaming out of the media i would like to ask you uh, again now looking at the current situation on the ground in the ukraine what are we seeing now what is happening in the Ukraine um, at the moment, in your eyes? I think the Zelensky regime is falling apart. Uh, they're beginning to engage in uh, mutual recrimination. They're the key people in the structure are attacking each other, blaming each other. Uh, the forces in the field, which have been crumbling slowly for many, many months, are now really falling apart very quickly. Uh, there is no appetite anywhere in Ukraine to send more men into action. There's great resistance to it. The secret police, the SBU, is rounding people up and shooting people, but it's not enough. At the same time, the population lives in mortal fear of the Zelensky regime. In fact, I spoke with someone who came back quite recently within the last couple of days who told me that the population in Ukraine is far more afraid of the SBU and, and his, the Zelensky regime than they are of the Russians. And they all would like this to end. But you're, you're never going to hear that to the mainstream media. But I think that's where it is. And Zelensky seems to be very busy trying to close deals, selling off as much of Ukraine as he can to uh, various agricultural conglomerates and uh, Black BlackRock headed by Larry Fink and others. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to last much longer. What's amazing to me, again, is that the Russians have exercised so much patience. And at some point, I think their hand will be forced. Putin's hand will be forced. He's going to have to close up the distance to the river to be sure. They are going to retake Odessa. Uh, 
they will retake uh, Kharkov. Those, those things are already in in planning and execution in the case of Kharkov. They've got about 110, 120,000 troops moving towards Kharkov right now out of Kupyansk. They have 90 to 100,000 headed to Dnipro. We'll see those things happen. The question is, what do you do about this cancer in Kiev if if you're if you're Putin? You've got to get rid of it. It would be nice if the if the Ukrainian military itself took took things into hand and did something, but that hasn't happened. So at some point, their hand will be forced. I know that the Russian general staff is currently considering the mobilization of an additional 800,000 troops. Now, given that they're well over that number right now, what would they need an additional 800,000 troops to do? Well, if you get no agreement from the West, if no one will talk to you, if you cannot negotiate an end to this, you are compelled to march west. Mm -hmm. You will have to grudgingly cross the Dnieper River and hope that once you cross and start heading west, that people will take you seriously. I mean, the, the recent uh, photographs and news about tactical nuclear weapons being moved further west inside Russia, that's not designed to frighten everybody per se, because they have no interest in using those things. It's a demonstration of resolve. And it's telling us, it's, if you contemplate attacking us, we will deliver total war and you will not win. I mean, that's the message. We hold a very weak hand. There's a reason that uh, Chancellor Schultz and his colleagues have all laughed off Mr. Macron and his ridiculous statement about sending European forces or NATO forces into Ukraine. We certainly won't. Uh, we just cut 24,000 spaces out of the army. The U.S. Army is now 450,000. That's a smaller number than the number of Ukrainian soldiers killed in the war. And now that number is out. It's I'm told now it's over 500,000, approaching 530,000. But for years, for, for months, people kept saying, oh, no, that's not true. Now people are beginning to admit the truth. It's harder and harder to conceal these things. 500,000-plus have been wounded. You know, we're talking about a generation of Ukrainians whose lives have been destroyed. It's not going to last, but... You would think if there were a shred of humanitarian interest in hum in people in Ukraine, that Schultz and his colleagues would stand up and say enough is enough. I mean, it is striking. When this war started, even the most renowned war correspondents wrote, this war, Russia will lose within several months. Their armed forces, totally outmoded, ancient They're using tanks, which are totally out of fashion. Um, people were ridiculing the Russian armed forces, making fun of it. I mean, I remember colleagues uh, of yours, or you would say, you know, professional soldiers, uh, generals like uh, General Petraeus, but others saying, well, in the uh, February 2023, um, Mariupol will be reconquered, all these scenarios. What would you say after these two years now? What is your assessment of the Russian army from a military standpoint? How competent is Putin as a military leader and how competent are these armed forces of Russia? Uh, a successful military commander always knows the limitations of his force as well as its potential. Without understanding limitations, You can't hope to be successful because you will demand either too much or too little of the force you command. Uh, he is someone who I think from the very beginning wanted a limited war, and he went in with very limited means, only to discover that those means were inadequate. He corrected that problem. And today, the Russian military is probably stronger with higher morale, better discipline, better equipment, and better leaders at every level than it was in the 1980s. So I think it's probably the best of its kind, certainly in Eurasia, no question about it. And contrary to everybody's expectation, you know, Mr. Putin has been strongly supported in what he's done. Of course, there, there's always a 15%, sometimes 20, that doesn't like what any government does. But over 80%, I, I would estimate 85, based upon what I heard just within the last couple of days, 85% of the Russian population, <clears throat> excuse me, strongly supports 
what he's done. And he's he's been very it's he's very uh, reminiscent. This is going to sound strange to some of your listeners. He reminds me of Field Marshal Montgomery, uh, who commanded the Eighth Army in North Africa. Remember, the Eighth Army had been beaten to a pulp. You know, two over a quarter of a million men could not stand up to thirty four thousand Germans and seventy thousand Italians. He understood he had a morale problem. He understood that he needed new training, new leadership. He needed new equipment. He took his time. And he built a better force. And then once he launched the force, the force was very successful all the way through to the end of the Second World War with a few minor uh, exceptions. That's exactly what Mr. Putin and his generals have done. They built a very good force, but they never pushed it too far too fast. They avoided unnecessary casualties. And they took advantage of this, we call it the revolution in military affairs, which very simply is the links between space-based surveillance, intelligence, reconnaissance, uh, surveillance, and strike systems from mortars all the way up to tactical ballistic missiles. And he's annihilated the Ukrainians who played repeatedly into his hands and mm -hmm. attacked the, the absolutely impregnable defensive forces that were built to cover the flank, so to say, of this force that was being built up. It's worked brilliantly. We, we still haven't figured it out. We don't understand it. We haven't learned it. And people like Petraeus and others gave the Ukrainians terrible advice because they, they treated the Russian military establishment as a, some sort of backward World War II anachronism that could be defeated by a modernized World War II force. It's failed miserably. But again, you know, they are on the winning side, these retired generals and, and politicians, because they're well subsidized. They're well paid for having said what they did. Remember, it's the truth doesn't matter. That's the sad part. It's it's the message. The narrative is what counts. And if you supply the narrative and you pay people to repurpose and, and repeat the narrative over and over and over again, uh, then you eventually convince everybody it's true. And, and remember, most Americans were never interested in Eastern Europe. Hmm. And so when you step forward and say, well, all of these retired generals, were wrong. People look at you sort of with a blank stare. Uh, really? Well, they're generals, aren't they? I mean, this this is pathetic. It's tragic. Same thing's true in Great Britain, where you have lots of blowhards who are senior officers over there predicted the same nonsense. Will NATO accept a Ukrainian defeat? I mean, all these leaders have talked themselves so much into demonizing Putin as kind of a new Hitler, as this uh, some kind of cr crazy Alexander the Great who wants to conquer the whole world. I mean, can NATO just let Ukraine drop and say, okay, we were wrong, sorry, sort out your own things? Or do you expect that there will be some kind of well counter-reaction by the West? Is the West even capable of countering this has put in now the control of the situation. What would you say? You know, that's a good question. Uh, and I'm not sure that I'm in a good position to answer it, frankly. Uh, as I said before, I know what Americans are interested in. I know where they're focused. I, I don't know precisely in Europe what most European populations think. I do know that in Scandinavia, Germany, Austria, in the Netherlands, in the Germanic countries, there is still a willingness to march without much question in the direction that the government and the media tell them to move. It's disappointing. So I guess there are two possibilities. One is that we, uh, after the fall elections, get some sort of change in direction, and that change in direction results in an American decision to essentially end our participation in this debacle. I don't expect anyone to stand up and say, you know, we were wrong. We've done enormous damage. It'll be like Vietnam. Suddenly it vanishes from the airwaves. Mm -hmm. Our forces leave. They just pack it up and go away. It's what I keep trying to tell Europeans. We're a commercial power, but we're primarily an air and naval power. Mm -hmm. So when things don't go our way, we leave. You know, that's, that's the simple truth. That's one possibility. And then the Europeans say, oh, the Americans have abandoned this. They've left. Maybe it's time for us to do the same. That's one possibility. I don't think NATO will survive, friend. I'd be very surprised if it survives this whole crisis eventually. It'll go down. 
Hmm. On the other hand, there's another disappointing possibility. And that is you end up people, you remember this uh, uh, film called Untergang. And at the end of the film, uh, the man who was playing, uh, Bruno Ganz, who was playing Hitler, you know, says, uh, goodbye, I'm going into my office now to shoot myself or something. And you have this women standing out there and said, mein Führer, you know, what about the endgültiger Krieg, endgültiger Sieg? You know, and he looks at them like, what are you, an idiot? <laughs> I guess, I guess you know, uh, it took a lot of Germans time to figure out that Soviet forces were really on the outskirts of Berlin. They couldn't believe it. Uh, and I'd say that our media has done an excellent job of misleading everybody in Europe and to a lesser extent here, because as I say, we do have alternative sources and people aren't really interested in it. And you still have a New York Times, which astonishingly brought out this report last Sunday, where they said there are 12... CIA secret bunkers, more or less at the Russian border since 10 years. I mean, it's amazing that our newspapers didn't even quote the New York Times. And the New York Times had to say, well, Putin was not so wrong after all when he said that the Americans were really interfering, were really, you know, on our outskirts in Ukraine. I mean, the Putin narrative was somehow confirmed by these reports. I mean, at least even the New York Times brings these kind of reports. This is a silver lining of some kind. Well, what that really indicates, because we've been down this road before, where reports are leaked deliberately from the Intelligence Committee because mm -hmm. the decision has been made to end everything, to, to basically begin the gradual retreat or withdrawal. We had similar experiences in the last year or so in Afghanistan. Now, we always knew that everything that was being said about Afghanistan was a lie. But again, it wasn't confirmed until near the end when it became clear, well, we're, we're going to get out. And you have similar problems in the Middle East right now. We did that in Vietnam. It was only towards the end that you began to see the truth emerge. So I'm sure that the New York Times probably said, well, what do we lose by publishing this? Because it's probably going to happen anyway. They've leaked it. If we don't publish it, somebody else will. And uh, we want to be able to say that we did tell the truth at some point. <laughs> because so you like, would say this is like a mental preparation for leaving, for giving it all up. I think so. Yeah. I think so. We always end on an optimistic note in these um, not so optimistic times. And I want to ask you as a final question. Um, I have a theory, an optimistic theory, and I, uh, I just will present it to you very shortly, um, and, and you have to counter it, or probably you find it's uh, it, it's somehow corresponding to reality. I think it's a gut feeling, probably it's wishful thinking. I don't know. I think that the Russian president, who has now the upper hand militarily, he wants to, as he said demilitarize the Ukraine. He doesn't want NATO in his um, garden. Um, he wants to create a buffer zone with some kind of militarily non-threatful, whatever kind of rest state of, of Ukraine. But then he will, from a position of relative strength, stretch out his hand to the West because the Russians and the Chinese are not very easy bedfellows. And the alliance of China and Russia is not really an, an, an alternative from the Russian perspective to the Russian relationship with the West. Because my gut feeling is the Russians think, and especially Putin, they are some kind of Europeans. They want to have the, um, the Western respect. They want to be respected by the West. So the good news is when Putin wins this war, he reaches his goals, then he has a position of relative strength, and then he will try to build a bridge again to the West. Is that realistic or is, it, is this total wishful optimism? Well, I think most of what you've said is accurate. And again, I go back to what I said earlier about Putin. Let's hope that Mr. Putin remains in office for the foreseeable future because he's the one who does share your uh, 
uh, orientation towards the West, particularly towards Germany. Uh, he's someone who knows history, and he knows that the two world wars were anomalies. Those were exceptions in the history of the German and Russian-speaking peoples. The majority of Germans were always doing business with Russia and vice versa. The two benefited from each other. He sees it in those terms and would ultimately like to see that happen again. Uh, having said that, he would like to have good relations with Poland. Uh, and he's made that very clear on numerous occasions. So that much, I think, is true. It's a mistake to attach too much significance to this Chinese thing in, in the sense that there's some problems there. China and Russia are perfectly made for each other. Why? Because Russia has all the resources, the abundance of minerals, you, you name it, and the agriculture.